Let's go ahead and go to the reading of the Word, and then I'll pray afterward. So it's in John chapter 1. Um, I actually had this uh, idea for this sermon before I realized this was the week we were sending the Waldens, but uh, praise be to God, He is faithful as well to bring everything together. So let's start in verse 29. I wanted to do the whole chapter and then maybe the whole book. It's just like, how, where do you stop? But uh, I settled on starting verse 29. The next day he saw Jesus coming, he being John the Baptist. And he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Let me make sure I'm on. Yes. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and I have borne witness that this is the Son of God. The next day, John was standing with two of his disciples. He looked at Jesus as he walked by and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? They said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, Come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying. They stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip, and he said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael, and he said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, and he said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word, for your spirit that guides us into all truth. This isn't just some story made up by man. These are the true words of God. The Holy Scriptures, it's, we can use it to teach, to learn, to rebuke, to admonish. Lord, uh, your word is sharper than a two-edged sword, and you promise your word will not come back to you void. I pray, Lord, that you will use me, your vessel, today to share the truths from the gospel. But Lord, more than that, I pray for the ears of those who hear that they will be able to hear your message and respond in faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Gosh, it's been a number of years ago, but Michelle and I, uh, on our 25th anniversary, went on a small ship cruise to Alaska. Um, I thought of that because recently we've been going through the photos and making a photo book, and it brought back a lot of good memories. Um, I do remember the very first night we were on the ship. So they brought us on the ship. We had our safety briefing. We kind of went and got unpacked, and then we had dinner. So we're in the middle of dinner. I don't know. We had, I know I had had my salad. They brought out our main course that we had ordered, and uh, all of a sudden the captain of the ship calls down and says, leave your food where it is, come up on deck, 
you've got to see this. And uh, a couple of folks were like, are we supposed to just leave our food here? Well, it was not an option to stay there at your food. Everybody had to get up on deck. Come on, everybody, get up out of your seat. Get up out of your seat. So we get up on deck, and then um, they point out a small group of humpback whales that were swimming just 100 yards or so away from the ship. And uh, they had a couple of marine biologists there with us. They were talking to us about, we learned about baleen and uh, bubble fishing and all kinds of things. Lots of people taking pictures. They're describing to us this wonderful sight that we saw just uh, 100 meters or so away as they're swimming around. In fact, I think they even swam under the ship. Uh, there were a lot of other encounters after that, but staying down in the galley or down in the kitchen you know, where we were eating was not an option. How much more so in today's story where we read about John the Baptist uh, telling his own disciples about Jesus Christ. Um, it was not an option for them to just stay there and do nothing. Um, I'm reminded today, as we're sending the Walden children off on various mission trips, how I was first invited to come and see. Uh, my mom and I, and uh, I have three stepbrothers and sisters, um, we're living with my dad out in California. My dad left us and disappeared. Uh, so here's my mom in California, single mom. And uh, we had a small MG convertible. I don't know if you've ever seen an MG, but it's a small car. So she got a hitch on the back of the car, and we go across country with a U-Haul. So we get back to Columbus, which is where we had family, and uh, my mom, again, a single mom, hello, aunt, sorry, squirrel. Um, my mom, who was a single mom, uh, as you can imagine, with four kids, was not easy. I was four years old at the time. Um, so a after we had lived in Columbus for a little while, my aunt, basically, just to give my mom a break, said, hey, why don't I take Mario and Paula, his sister, take them to church with me on Sunday um, the other two were old enough, they were older, and so, you know, let them go off and do their own thing, but Mario and Paula, let me, let me take them to church. And that was the first time somebody had asked me to come and see. And as I was in Sunday school, and, and it wasn't easy for her either, I'd, I want to make that clear, so she gave up her Sunday school, so essentially she went to worship while we went to Sunday school, and uh, of course, after Sunday school's over, you know, antsy kids, they're not going to stay around. So she took us, uh, usually to her house, we'd have lunch together. But I tell you the story because uh, it was the beginning of a come and see. It was just a, you know, I don't have to preach to you. I don't have to tell you what you're doing wrong. Um, I'd never heard about Jesus before that um, as a kid. And um, my family certainly had not. <laughs> But I remember being invited to come and see, and I remember lots of other, so I did. I received the Lord uh, when I was there. Uh, I didn't know what I was doing, but God did. There were lots of other Sunday school teachers who invited me to come and see. Come and see David and Goliath. Come and see Moses. Come and see Jesus Christ as he walks the shores of Galilee. And uh, it was fascinating to me it is now as I look back just how God has used so many different people in my life. In high school um, we had Fellowship of Christian Athletes that was a Bible study group. There was a group called Koinonia that was kind of a weekend retreat sort of thing and in all of those I got the opportunity to come and see and to be with Jesus and just learn a little bit more about this Savior who like I said when I first trusted in him I had no idea what I was doing. And then when my wife and I uh, went away to college, InterVarsity Christian Fellowship was a group that we got involved with, and that was another opportunity to come and see. And not only to come and see Christ, but to come and see other believers who were passionate about Christ and who really believed and were putting their life in Christ's hands. Um, it was a friend of mine from high school who first invited us as after we got older and had graduated from college, 
uh, had invited us to come and see a church of the Reformed faith. I had never heard the gospel the way that I heard it at that church in Dublin at Northwest Presbyterian. I always thought the gospel was, it was about God coming to save men, but it was up to me to do the good works. I'd never heard the message that the good work that needed to be done was Christ and Christ alone. So I remember all these times just to tell you, come and see can be very powerful. Come and see can change lives. You might see it, you might not, but come and see just like we read in today's message, uh, in today's scripture. It was very important. But there were also times where I was not, uh, how do I put it, I was discouraged because I wasn't successful. I'd invite somebody to come and see, or I would share with them something about the hope that was within me, but they would reject it, or they'd say, that's nice, you know, kind of pat you on the head and say, that's nice for you, I'm glad you found something that works for you. And it can be discouraging sometimes, um, but I'm sure that someday... I'll learn that some of those were maybe the first step, just like my aunt taking me to, uh, I mean, I know I went for months before the message finally started going through to me when I was at that Sunday school with my aunt. It's not always easy to share your story with others, and I think there's a lot of reasons why in the sermon I'm going to cover a couple of, at least in my life, why I think it's hard. Uh, But I'm getting ahead of myself. So if you're taking notes today, there's four points. Sorry, I tried to make it three, but I couldn't, couldn't narrow it down. The first is the message, the message. The second point is the encounter. The third is the need to share, the need to share. And the fourth is the resistance. So the first is the message. I find it interesting This whole story starts with John the Baptist. So John the Baptist is out preaching about repentance. There were a lot of people back then that thought that John might be the Messiah or maybe the prophet or maybe Elijah come again. But he wouldn't have any of that. Um, And it said, in fact, we're introduced to John earlier in the chapter in verse 6. It says, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness to the light. Did you see how many times, not only in that verse, but in the other verses that we read today, it calls John a witness. He came to bear witness to Christ. He came to bear witness to the light. So it starts with the message. It's important that we get the message right. I don't want to stress this part too hard because I don't want to discourage you, but it's important to study uh, I, to sit here on Sunday mornings and listen, really listen to what Pastor Dan has to say, to let God teach you and encourage you through his word. It's got to start somewhere, and it's got to start with the truth. The Bible says you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Not my beliefs, not what I try to persuade you, but the truth will make you free. That's what makes come and see so powerful, I think, because it's not about me making you believe anything. It's me bringing you to the, foot, to the foot of Christ. I pray that all of you are taking time to study and learn. Um, we can only be a witness to those things that we know. Wouldn't it be foolish if you've ever been to a trial, and I've been a juror on a couple of trials now where people are called to be witnesses and they're called up to the stand to tell their side of the story. Wouldn't it be silly if they came up and said, well, I really didn't see anything. I wasn't there. I have no idea what went on, but I'm sure he's guilty. He looks guilty, you know? So you really can't be a witness to something that you haven't received yourself. That doesn't mean that you can't talk about things you don't know in depth, but your witness would be hearsay. Even Jesus himself said, I only speak the words that the Father has given me. And if it was important for him, can you imagine how important it is for us? God gives gifts to the church, the Bible says. He gives teachers, preachers, evangelists, 
and others, that we might be equipped, the Bible says, to live and to do every good work, that we might be equipped to live in a way that would glorify God and that we could enjoy Him forever. But how can we know unless someone is sent? So it, the, knowing the message is important, but as uh, I guess it was Charlie said earlier, how wonderful are the feet of him who brings good news. That's in Romans 10, 14. So now we talked about the message. What about the encounter? What do we learn about that in today's scripture? The encounter that I'm thinking of is the two disciples of John. It starts in verse 35. Let's see if I can find it here. Man, it's really hard to see up here. So John's standing with his two disciples. So these are two disciples of John. They're following him because they believe he had a message that was worth listening to. John, as we've already seen, the message he's giving is, it's not me, it's somebody else who comes after me. So John points out Jesus and says, behold, the Lamb of God. Simple invitation, come and see, look, look, there's the Messiah. And it's interesting as they follow him, uh, <laughs> so Jesus says, what, what are you looking for? And in verse 38, their response, uh, I'm not sure exactly what to make of this, but he says, where are you, they say, where are you staying? Uh, they didn't say, hey, John said, you're the Messiah, are you really? Um, you know, they didn't get involved in a big theological discussion. They just said, hey, where are you staying? We want to come see what's going on. The response from Jesus is even better. He said, come and you will see. Come spend some time with Christ. Simple invitation. Come and spend time. But it must have been some time that they spent together because almost immediately it says, Andrew goes to his brother and he said, you know, hey, we found the Messiah. Must have left quite an impression. He didn't say, you know, well, let's go back to Moses. Let's go back to Deuteronomy and let's start looking through who this Messiah should be. He just said, hey, come with me and see this guy. This, this guy, he's the Messiah. I believe it. John said it. I believe it. He didn't, no long discourse, no need to explain, just said, come and see. So that encounter with Christ, which I hope all of us in this room have had, you know who Jesus is. Um, you don't have to preach some message, some great theological explanation. You just need to say, come and see. So that's the message and the encounter, the need to share. Why do we need to share this? Well, <laughs> there's a lot of good reasons. Um, you know, as we saw Andrew, Simon's brother, basically just, just had to. I mean, it's almost like it bursts out of you. If you remember, at least I do, when I first came to know Christ, I had no idea what to share about Christ. Um, in fact, I couldn't even explain why I believed in Christ. Um, and yet, God used that through me talking to my siblings, to my mom, my mom who had been a Christian or had at least been introduced to Christianity when she was younger, had all but walked away from Christ. And then through God's change in my heart, she knew what a rotten apple I was. And it's hard to tell nowadays, I hope. But, uh, but she's like, something, there's something there. And so she started coming to church, started taking us to church. Instead of sending us to church, Patty, get them out of my way, get them out of my hair. It's like, I want to start going to church with you guys. So she started coming to church. She became a Sunday school teacher um, and had a lot of good years uh, serving Christ before she passed away. But uh, it's wonderful to see how a small ripple in a puddle can lead to bigger and better things. The need to share, it's not just because there's anything in it for us. Um, who led you to Christ? I mean, think back. I've shared some of my testimony, some of my story. Do you have similar stories? I assume most of you do. It was a coworker, a friend, maybe a 
a fellow student at school, somebody shared the gospel with you. And um, what a change. It, it's all just about telling our own story, giving a reason for the hope that we have. It's not for points with God. It's not because it's easy or fun. Um, I can, I'm sure when we talk to the Waldens when they get back, they will have stories to tell, things that they encountered, wonderful things they saw. But as I mentioned, they're giving up summer jobs, opportunities to make money. Um, and it's not always easy or fun. But there's a joy in the sharing. I hope you've experienced it. But um, there's not only a joy, but um, Christ has given us that as a ministry. So the need to share is more than just, well, if I do this, then people... It's not about the results even. Um, it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 18 to 20, all this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God who was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. What a great ministry God has given to us. If we didn't have that ministry, then as soon as we were saved, he might as well just take us. You know, why leave us here? It's not because it's easy, as I said, but God has made us ambassadors. I actually, that just reminded me, one of the things I didn't think about in terms of high school, I, the church I was going to had a group called Royal Ambassadors. And I remember, what a strange name. I really didn't know where that was from in the, in the Bible. But it's from this, mess, this passage right here. You are ambassadors of Christ. It's like we're ambassadors from a foreign land to the rest of the folks on earth. Our home isn't here. Our home is in heaven with Christ. And he's gone to prepare a place for us. That's a great story to tell. Finally, the last point, the resistance. How am I doing? The resistance. So in verse 45, let's see, it'll be on the next page. So Philip goes and talks to Nathaniel. We have found him who, whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph, Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Have you ever experienced resistance when you've tried to share with others? I know uh, my oldest brother I've tried to share Christ with several times. Um, and like I said, his response to me is usually, You know, that's good for you. I'm glad there's something for you to believe in. It's not for me. Perhaps you have been the resistant one. Um, perhaps you're the one who said, yeah, that's superstition, you know, on the same level as believing in little green men. But we're really, we're called to be witnesses. As we heard of John, we're called to tell the story, not to convert people, but just through the Holy Spirit to bring them to the foot of Jesus where their heart can be changed. The word evangelism, boy, that can bring fear into the heart of just about anybody. I looked up evangelism. Evangelism, the word itself, evangel, means the same thing as gospel or good news. We have good news to share. We don't have to keep it to ourselves, and we don't have to be afraid to share it. But why do so many of us find it difficult? So this is where I said earlier, I, I've thought of a few things, at least that have been true in my life. And I am missing a page. There it is. Many of us have experienced strong-arm evangelism where somebody has come preaching fire and brimstone. It's not pleasant. Um, I actually asked uh, Brother Charlie before the service because I could not remember the guy's name, but I remember when I was at Ohio State as a grad student going to the Oval, and there was a man out there who was preaching. Praise God he was preaching. I'm not saying this is always wrong either. But it does leave usually a bad taste when somebody's saying, 
you know, you're going to hell unless you come to Christ. And that's true, but not always the best way to say it. It was Brother Jeb, right? So Jeb was his name. And uh, I remember going there and wanting to sit on the far side of the oval. I, I didn't want to hear it. And I was a Christian at the time, but I didn't really care for that message. How different, though. If you were here last week, Pastor Dan said, I think I just lost my, what did he say? I, I should have written it down, but he said something like, I think I've just lost my, my good will points or something like that when he was talking about hell, where it says that those who had the mark of the beast and did not have the mark of Christ or the mark of God on their foreheads, basically the mark of God on their lives, that hell was reserved as a place where God's full wrath would be poured out on them. What a terrible message to give to somebody but how lovingly and how gracious Pastor Dan was last week. It, as, a, as a shepherd, as somebody whose heart is just going out, if you're not there, if you don't have the mark of God on your life, if you don't believe and have faith in Christ for, for God's sake, for your sake, today is the day. Listen to God's voice. It's out of love that that sting kind of gets remediated. It's not nearly as bad when you hear it from somebody who is saying it in love. Another reason a lot of people find it hard to share is the, the world around us really uh, discourages it. I guess I'll say it that way. Um, that may be good for you, but in all tolerance, you know, all lead, always lead to God. Um, why would your way be any better? And my response to that would just be, it's not me saying it, it's Christ himself. Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. I'm not trying to be arrogant. I'm not trying to cram Christ down your throat. I'm just telling you the truth that I believe. And if the, the thing it's hard to believe is that not, not that God made only made one way, but that he made any way at all. Why would God, the sovereign of the universe, even care? Who is man, we read earlier, that you would be mindful of him? So the Bible tells us in Matthew 5, you are the light of the world, a city set on a hill that cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand that it can give light to all the house. Another reason people, I think, shy away from sharing is they don't feel equipped. And that's what I'm hoping to dispel today. I want you to be equipped. You need to be equipped. But you don't have to have all the answers. You're not meant to have all the answers. Uh, you're meant to say, come and see. You're meant to be in a, a witness. You're meant to be an ambassador for Christ. Not to speak for him, necessarily, but to speak on his behalf, to encourage others to come and see, just like you have been encouraged to come and see. There's a song by Michael Card called Come and See, where, and in fact, that, that song was just going over and over and over in my head, which is why I chose that message for today. Um, in that song, there's a line that says, come and see, come follow me, to a road where believing is seen. Did you catch that? We often have it backwards. We say seeing is believing. But that's not what Michael Card said. And honestly, that's not what the Bible says either. Believing is seeing. Come believe, and then you will see. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, they saw Jesus. They spent time with Jesus. They were with him days and days on end. They called him teacher. They called him master. Not in the same way that the disciples did. But they saw, but they didn't believe. How much better for those that believe and then can see. This message is too important not to share. Just like the captain and crew on our cruise, they would not take no for an answer. We had to go up on deck to see those magnificent animals. And we've got such a more important and such a better message to tell.
Philip's response to Nathaniel was, come see for yourself. Come check it out. Don't take my word for it. I'm not here to strong arm you or convince you or cram my truth down your throat. Just come see for yourself. Make up your own mind. In a world where it's hard to talk about faith, Philip and his simple example of what it means to bear witness to our faith, Philip simply invites others to come and see. See and experience for themselves what has been meaningful and life-changing to him. Philip's example suggests ours is not to cajole or convert, but simply to invite others to experience God's love. Once Philip invites Nathaniel to come and see, he kind of steps out of the whole story. We don't hear about Philip again. Philip's example reminds us the willingness of others to embrace the gospel doesn't rest on our abilities or power of persuasion. The ability to see Jesus as a gift from God through grace and the mysterious movements of the Holy Spirit is from Him. Ours is just to invite. Invite others to get a glimpse of what we've seen and to do it in a loving way. Philip's words to Nathaniel, come and see, are a wonderful model for us to learn how to share our Christian faith. Talking about our faith is often difficult. I know that. But there are many ways to say that to others. Come and see. Anyone can do it. God does the rest. So in conclusion, you can say it. Come and see. Simple, open, inviting words. When's the last time you said come and see? To a friend, to a neighbor? Maybe it's as simple as saying it to somebody. What your church means to you or what faith has meant to you in your life. Maybe it's inviting someone to come to church because they're going through a rough time. Maybe someone you know has had a divorce or lost a spouse or they're lonely. Maybe they have a child who might enjoy the friendship of the youth group. Ask them to come and see like my aunt did. Bring them with you. Hey, why don't you have your son come with my daughter and to youth group, it'll give you a break. You just never know. God can work through those invitations in mighty ways. It's not about forcing Jesus, your faith, your church on anyone. It's just about being willing to say to someone in some small way, this is what makes my life meaningful. This is what keeps me going. This is what God's love means to me. Come and see are words that anyone can say. You can say them. I can say them. Don't worry, you can do it. You'll find a way. Just three little words, come and see. God does the rest, and I can't wait to see what he'll do as we begin to share our lives with others.